the chemistry, the relationship between chemistry and art is a very old one. It goes back thousands of years. Indeed, the cave artists in Europe were painting images of the animals, presumably the hunt, going back at least 40,000 years. Recently, about five years ago, a research group in South Africa found strong evidence of earth pigment, ochres, crushed up in a device with binder added. And that binder was, is casein, the protein, the venerable protein isolated from uh, milk yogurt. More about that in a few minutes. But the relationship of chemistry and art is a long, long-term one. Now, the research that I'm doing, which we'll show you with my student, uh, Mike, the research we're doing focuses on synthetic, organic-based dyes and pigments. And before we even go on into this video, I just want to mention for people that don't know this, a paint formulation would consist of a pigment. Now a pigment is a material that has, is colored in the visible region and not soluble in water or alcohol. On the other hand, a dye, traditionally isolated from plants, would be soluble in water and or alcohol solvents. A paint contains a pigment or dye, a vehicle, the vehicle could be water, it could be an organic solvent, an oil, and a binder. Now, the cave artists may have been using just saliva as a binder, but based on recent evidence, they probably were using casein from lactating mammals, milk source. More about casein or milk paint a little bit further in the video. Now, organic color chemistry development has been undergoing rapid change in the past few decades. It's an exciting field right now and one with significant growth. Our research here will be focusing on the so-called azo dyes and pigments made by a reasonably green methodology called the grind methodology which we'll be demonstrating to you. And the preparation of so-called gouache and casein paint formulations with minimal waste. With the azo dyes and pigments, it's currently from the point of synthetics, 65% of the global market. The formation of azo dyes is a process well understood by organic chemists. It involves a process of formation of a diazonium intermediate, which then is contacted with a coupling agent and color developments, uh, develops. The azo is the chromophore that is responsible for the absorption of light in the visible region, giving you the different colors that you observe. Um, your azos will provide you with beautiful yellows, Values of uh, use of red, brown, orange, and you can get some violets, greens, and blues. So it's a very, very important synthetic dye and or pigment. Unfortunately, traditional diazonium process generates an incredible amount of aqueous acid waste. And if that's discharged into the environment, it's also carrying with it unreacted starting materials used to make the dye or pigment. Now, some azo compounds are known carcinogens, and we stay away from them in our research, but also some azo compounds are used as medications. The organic color chemistry development, as I said, is undergoing really a renaissance and um, regards, uh, with regard to organic color development, we see dye applications in high-tech fields, electronic devices, 
linear and nonlinear optics, reprography, reproduction of, uh, reproduction of uh, documents, sensors, biomedical applications, and also important in metal ion complexation detection methods in analytical chemistry. About 10 years ago, a research group published a very interesting paper by which they reported production of azodizing pigments via a so-called grind method, keeping waste to a minimum. And indeed, grind methodology has been used now by a number of groups just in the past four or five years. We noticed in these papers, particularly the primary lead, there was no mention of what would be done with the dyes or pigments produced. And we are utilizing them in the direct formulation of so-called gouache and milk paint, casein paint formulations for artists. Now, I myself am what's called a, a naive artist, self-trained, no formal education in techniques, but my chemistry does help me and I do this for recreation and relaxation. I'll show you one of my masterpieces <laughs> by the end of the, do the uh, video. But um, the ASO grind methodology has a lot to offer, a lot to offer. So we'll run through now and we'll show you the process of color development and how we process the material to uh, form these paint formulations. Okay, so student Mike is preparing to add three chemicals here in a demo of azo color development. He has one naphthol, sulfonylic acid, and sodium nitrite. Any organic chemist would recognize these as standard reactants in a conventional diazonium azo process. So Michael will add these now. It is important to keep the mortar and pestle in a freezer at zero to five degrees before use because diazonium processes can be very unpredictable and very, very exothermic. Aliphatic diazoniums are particularly unstable, but we work with aromatic ones which are far more stable. Nonetheless, we keep the mortar and pestle cold right up to the point of grinding, mixing and grinding. A few spritzes of water were placed in the mortar before Mike began the process of grinding. And it's important for five or six minutes to mix them together and grind very well. We can see that it's already, right, Mike, starting to darken. and mix it all together and then grind it well. The challenge will be for chemical engineers to develop a process by which grinding can be done on a larger scale. I'm sure they will be able to do that. And thus, we can start to look at making this important class of synthetic dye or pigment on a large scale with minimal waste. And I may add, the acrylic paints are not so totally safe. Even though they're water-based, there are organic components like glycols, and we are discharging incredible amounts of the acrylics into the environment, and they are not totally safe. There are small molecular weight acrylics in there, and uh, I do think we'll show you the milk paint has a lot to offer, and it's making a comeback. It had been actually pushed it aside with the introduction of the acrylics, perhaps in the 50s, but it's making a comeback and more artists are turning their attention to it because they want to stay with something renewable such as casein protein from milk sources. Do you need a little more water? The spatula. The challenge will be for scale up, but grinding technology is available. A little more water or not yet? Uh, yeah, a little bit more. 
Okay. We're in the process of developing this research. It's not an exact science yet. Now, we will be trying to minimize any discharge of waste, as you'll see. We're going to be diluting this reaction after five or six minutes with plenty of water. We'll add the binders. And then the material, you know, we're starting to see the red color now, the material will be placed in a dehydrator overnight. And the next day, we're able to recover the solid paint formulation, which would have the binder and the dye or pigment. It's coming along now. Now you may be supposing when all is said and done what it'll look like. And that would be the typical material that he's producing right now. This was the first one, right, Mike, that we made, the one naphthol, and it's reported to be a reddish-orange color. And uh, that would simply need to have water added, and it would be ready to be used as, uh, as a gouache water-based formulation. Gouache was used along with casein milk paint for illustrations for many decades. Beautiful illustrations were done with gouache and gouache is opaque. Watercolor, of course, normally is uh, uh, more translucent. This would be a swatch. And that would not be of the one he's doing now. It would be one that we made a second one, and that was applied. And you see, I was using an expensive brush. We get a very nice reddish-orange color. So far, so good? Consistent with what we saw the first time? What was it? Zero dash zero zero two. Yeah. Yep, that's right. This, I would like to mention to a viewers, would be a ground up, commercially available watercolor cake. We grind it up, I add binder, water, mix well, dehydrate, and that is a gouache formulation made from a watercolor. The material I found is very affordable is made uh, by Giorgione, and it's really a decent quality considering it's about $11 US dollars post paid on eBay. I have purchased actually a number of these, and I pop out a cake of choice. Comes with a brush, comes with two brushes. And also, uh, for those that want to make gouache this way, they add what's called Chinese white. Now, it used to be called China White, but that's a street name for a, uh, an analog of fentanyl analgesic. So now they call it Chinese White, a veteran with zinc oxide. And that provides the opacity if you're going to prepare a gouache from watercolor. So I took a pop one out. It's four grams. And uh, this is a nice source of uh, 36 uh, colors that can be used to make paint formulations. And of, and of course, they can be blended with some of the azos that we're making uh, if you want to generate your own uh, hues. So far, so good, huh? Notice we're not getting any of that side material like we did one time. This is much more like the one we, we did. You didn't notice any heat, did you? Is it still cold or warming up to room temperature? Uh, you mean the the the, uh, the mortar? It's, it's warming up. Yeah, yeah, it's been well behaved. I've never had any problem with this. 
and we only work on a scale of uh, a gram or so, three quarters of a gram to a gram. And uh, the challenge, as I said, will be to uh, scale up for manufacturing, but there's enormous potential here. Do you think that's about five or six minutes? Okay, so at this point, we're going to go over to the bench top. Now, we've been using, as we develop this from the initial paper, uh, we warm up some water. Here we're using 50 milliliters of distilled water, uh, just warmed up, maybe 45, 50 degrees Celsius. And then we'll add that right in there. You see a very nice red color now. And of course, oh, I should have mentioned uh, the chemicals that we're using, an organic chemist would recognize. Using the sulfonylic acid, we are producing a dye. Because of our selection of the starting materials, we're getting a water-soluble material. If we did it a different way with slightly different uh, reactants, we would then generate a non-water-soluble pigment. And I may add, the cave artists were using the venerable mineral pigments, ochres, the earth pigments the yellows, the reds, along with uh, charcoal. And of course, the ochres are still uh, valued uh, greatly in the art world. So far, so good, huh? Yeah, and then special. All right. It's been very consistent. And uh, as Michael does these reactions, he's gaining expertise. We're going to prepare today in this video a typical gouache formulation. Now, watercolors traditionally would have as binder gum arabic or dextrin. Dextrin is low molecular weight material derived from uh, uh, complex uh, starch complex carbohydrates. We're going to be using a blend that I developed, a, 50, a solution of 50% polyethylene glycol, which is used in foods and perfectly safe, uh, molecular weight 8,000. It has in it also 5% by volume glycerol, because that's very good for aiding brushability, flow of paint off a brush. We'll be blending that with a commercial sample called, uh, the registered trademark is Aquasol. It's a water-based synthetic polyimid binder. And the company is Polymer Chemistry Innovations in Arizona. And they gift me plenty of different molecular weight uh, ranges of Aquasol. Interestingly enough, a chemistry professor at the University of Pisa in Italy was asked to touch up a masterpiece. And he used the water-soluble Aquazole because decades from now, with technology advancing, they may want to remove the touch-up and replace it with some other material. So he used the Aquazole with great success. I'm blending the two to see how they behave. So far, so good. But uh, as research is, we're going more and more towards uh, utilization of casein. It's a wonderful binder. Under the right conditions, it can be applied f for external use. Milk paint, it's used. Furniture finishers are fully aware. And it's somewhat related to chalk paint. Indeed, uh, with the casein, I often add so-called slake lime, calcium hydroxide, um, putty. You add water and uh, that also uh, works beautifully and it also will preserve because after all casein is a protein, it's biodegradable. So that will assist in the stability of the paint formulation and it can be used for months as long as it's stored. Ready for the binder or not yet? Now normally, if you were doing this reaction the conventional way, for example, in the old days when I was in school, 
you would be generating an you would be doing the reaction on in ice water. You would generate an incredible amount of aqueous acid waste with uh, some very unpleasant materials discharged right into the drain. And we just can't do this anymore. It's, that's why uh, there's a growing demand for dyes and pigments now, the synthetics, but we have to have good methodology. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do quite arbitrarily, you don't use a lot of binder. The key is not to use too much or it will take control of the paint formulation. You want the pigment to be orchestrating this. So you never add too much of the binder. It depends really on what you're using. We're gonna be evaporating the water, so it doesn't matter about that. So we'll put in that amount. That's the polyethylene glycol. And now the aquasol. It's a 20% solution, aquasol. Interestingly enough, if you heat the water up, it's less soluble. It's one of these type of compounds that you've got to keep it cold, a little bit colder, and it actually dissolves faster. I shake it overnight to dissolve it. So we have some of that. You might say, that's not a lot. Well, remember, we only started with a gram or so, small scale, so we wouldn't suddenly pour in a lot of these binder. And that will do it to the trick. So now Mike will blend that together so it's evenly distributed. And while in the, the dehydrator, concentrate down, and the binder will be uniformly spread, and hopefully we'll come out with a very nice material like that that can be stored indefinitely until you're ready to use it. For example, we may make next week a yellow azo dye. I could then take that blend it with some of the blue that's commercially available and generate uh, green values. <laughs> In the old days, you'd filter this. If it's a pigment, you would filter it on a filter, uh, a buchner funnel. You would filter, collect, and then the waste would be dumped right down the drain all over the world, wherever there are colleges and universities. And which, that's why I do hope some of the viewers will consider utilizing this. Um, we are going to propose, my colleague Melissa in the chemistry department and I, we're going to be proposing the development of a chemistry of art uh, lecture lab course. And we think it would uh, interest many of the art majors, in fact, anybody on campus. In these difficult times with COVID, it's important for people to have a recreational outlet to minimize stress. Painting, music are often of great value to uh, our species. So there may be a lot of people that would be interested in taking a non-intimidating course where we bring to the table our knowledge of chemistry. We can help people teach them how to paint Melissa is also a very talented, she has natural ability, she paints, and uh, we have great interest, great excitement over bringing technology to the table. And our focus is to provide artists with this option. That looks pretty good. Now what he's going to do, Mike, he's going to very carefully pour it in a plastic weigh dish. It'll all evaporate down. See, we're getting most of it. There's going to be minimal waste. Why don't you give that a little rinse huh, with the green uh, container? Yeah. Try to get a little more of it so we don't have much waste. Now, the, whatever residue we have, I will add more water and pour it in a waste bottle. And we can uh, put it in a container and let it evaporate down in the fume hood so we're not discharging waste. This is a very, very good experiment even for those majoring in analytical or environmental science uh, to appreciate that uh, we can make technical developments. We will now dispose of the waste, uh, put it in a waste bottle, minimal waste really. And now, 
what I've found is if we place it in a commercial food dehydrator, I can leave this in there. I had the blue one that I showed you before. I left that going for two or three days because I simply was doing other things. And then we simply place it on there. And I have found that normally it will be ready. Oh, 24 hours. Doesn't give off any fumes, nothing to worry about. It'll be concentrated down. Then I take the residue, the, the paint formulation, and uh, transfer it to a mortar and pestle, grind it up to a powder like we did with the blue. It'll be ready for use when needed. The last thing will be to show you uh, we must show you one of my masterpieces. Well, anyway. Okay. Step back and say, start with the last thing. So, okay. The last thing we would like to show you today would be an example of some of the naive artwork that I do. And then uh, just a close-up of a milk solution that's being converted to quark and whey. One of the things I developed, and Melissa and I would be showing students this in our proposed course, artists know that if you use watercolor paper, it will warp when you use it. It has to be stretched. I take watercolor paper in this specific case. I also use poster board with great success. And with a spray adhesive or even a, a glue, I affix it to cardboard support. And that holds up very well. It doesn't buckle or warp. So this is something that we would be showing students. Now, I have a granddaughter coming up on her fifth birthday. So I said, well, I'll bring it in to show it to you. Uh, this is some of the amateur or naive art, comical art that I do. And I made this picture for her. She loves dolls. And if you look carefully, you'll see that this woman has Betty Davis eyes. And uh, because I'm teasing my five-year-old granddaughter. But she loves LOL and Barbie. So I made this for her as a little remembrance. And toys come and go, but if she uh, holds on to these, she'll be looking at this when she's 50 years old. The last thing we'll do is the preparation of milk paint. I took a gallon of skim milk earlier today, warmed it up to room temperature, poured it in a container. This had held pretzels, I think. Poured the milk right in, and for one gallon of milk, you add two cups of white vinegar. That's about 500 milliliters or so, maybe 470 milliliters of white vinegar. And the trick is add, gently stir, and stop. Otherwise, you'll get fine particles hard to filter. So this will sit for two or three hours. And you can see the quark. The quark, Q-U-A-R-K, cheese makers would know that it's basically the casein protein. The whey would be the, the supernatant, the liquid. So with the acidic conditions, the casein precipitates out. I filtered a little bit to show you the typical casein protein. Now, I also have commercially available uh, casein powder that I use. But this will then be filtered. I have cheesecloth coming in, but it'll be filtered. I will capture the casein uh, material that we need. Press it, squeeze the vinegar out, wash it two or three times to get the vinegar out, squeeze, and then dry it out, and the casein will then be our binder. If you're going to make a casein or milk paint, I would simply add the casein, some water, to one of the materials we're preparing, and stir it well, and then I add a very small amount of calcium hydroxide, mix it up, give it about an hour, and the paint is ready to be used. So th I hope this puts some ideas across to you, and I'm hoping that uh, educators will consider utilizing this in creative ways, and of course uh, you'll be able to contact me with any questions.